So I would like to talk about uh, autocratic learning uh, uh, on the case of um, the events around Alexievich's Nobel Prize. Uh, I've already read three articles in Belarus Digest on this topic. They are all are really insightful, so I'm not going to talk about the story, but I will also concentrate on, um, on uh, the concept of autocratic learning. Um, so, um, as both the first writer and the first woman from Belarus to receive the Nobel Prize in Literature, Alexievich became the center of public attention worldwide. While first Twitter messages in the Nobel announcement room reflected a small confusion regarding the unknown writer from the unknown land and reporter reported about 10,000 reporters googling Svetlana Alexievich, the subsequent media coverage of the issue, for instance, in The Guardian, The New York Times, The New Yorker, Spiegel, sketched out the broad picture of Alexievich's life, career, and main works. Um, in uh, December, Alexievich had to uh, travel to Sweden to uh, uh, hold in the Nobel lecture and then the banquet speech. Um, this is the story. The reactions uh, in Belarus and Russia, uh, authorities, neglect, tacit condemnation, self-censorship, societies in Belarus and Russia, identity crisis, uh, the, like the reactions in societies reflected identity crisis and uh, nationalist sentiments. Um, so I assume that uh, these reactions could be uh, explained by the uh, uh, by the fact that autocratic elites learn from the past and from Soviet legacy and um, that the norms uh, diffuse and uh, shape public attitudes in autocracies. So let me introduce this uh, concept of uh, autocratic, autocratic learning. In my dissertation, I work with external influences uh, and I differentiate between uh, unintended impact and intended impact. So in the case of intended impact or coordinated actions, we have uh, active sender and very passive recipient. So the sender, the country who tries to exert the influence, uses leverage, like control, external incentives, conditionality, intensity of linkages, just to influence the country, this passive recipient. In case of unintended impact or the norms diffusion, we have this really <coughs> passive sender, so we do not care about whether this country has intentions or not to influence the other country, but we concentrate on the recipient. Uh, recipient learns through adoption, adaptation, he is inspired, um, he emulates the policies of another country, of another actor. And how do we know that this uh, diffusion takes place? We look at references in the statements, in the laws, in laws uh, on adaptation facts and adoption facts and convergence. Uh, the um, definition of diffusion uh, is in, diffusion is seen as a largely non-intentional process uh, by which the adoption of particular regime type increases as others do, usually amongst those in geographic proximity or who share cultural and economic links. Uh, here we have this uh, non-intentional process and we have this probability that the more autocrats are around you, the more probable is that, that you would be autocratic and so on. So now uh, let's look at two uh, different examples of learning. Uh, the first one is autocratic learning, learning from the past. Um, the fact that Lukashenko, his retainers, official media in Belarus, and also then uh, officials in Moscow and in Russia and uh, society in Russia attempted to ignore and downplay the celebration of Lukashenko's award uh, is explained by the writer's critical stance towards current Belarusian and Russian regimes. Uh, Alexeyevich stated, I don't love the world of Beria Stalin put in Shoigu, it's not my world. She also openly stated her uh, views about uh, Ukrainian conflict and annexation of Crimea. She called Belarus a soft dictatorship. Um, and uh, here we have this reference to, uh, the, uh, to the Soviet Nobel Prize winners who were also like, um, uh, disdained by Soviet authorities. Uh, Alexeyevich said herself, uh, after all, there are such great shadows, Bunyan, Pasternak, these shadows are too great and they seem to come to life for me. This is very serious. Um, so all this uh, critical stance of Alexievich, of a Nobel Prize winner, caused, that, caused uh, this strategy of neglect and tacit condemnation uh, and uh, self-censorship, this de degree of self-censorship, which was reflected in the eagerness of the bureaucrats and officials to keep silence and disdain uh, disdain Alexievich resembled the good old Soviet tradition of how unloyal intellectuals were treated. Um, 
Like, let's uh, look at the reactions uh, uh, of authorities in Belarus and Russia. Lukashenko congratulated Alexievich only in the evening. Um, and uh, it's also interesting to see uh, this on the timeline. On the 9th of, the, of October, he said on the, uh, during the meeting with the construction workers at uh, Ostrovets, he said, it's important that uh, a Russian has won a Nobel Prize the first time since Soviet days. And it also means that we have freedom of speech in Belarus uh, because, um, you know, you, have, you can't say everything you want. The key now is how she's will, she'll use this for the benefit of your people, will survive any sort of opposition thought. And then, of course, Alexievich gave all her interviews where she criticized authorities. And um, three weeks later, Lukashenko said, if you talk bad along, uh, about homeland, if you're ashamed of it, then it's you who is a bad son. After that, there was... Um, uh, you know, the story when the Belarusian TV refused to broadcast the Nobel Lecture as well as the Nobel Prize award ceremony, referring to the technical and financial difficulties. Uh, and also when we talk about the um, state mass media, we, also, we always have this, um, not always, but usually, most of the time, we have this three components, the West as an enemy, critical stance of an author towards authorities, a national history, poor quality of the literary work, I have here um, a, um, an example of, uh, of an article from Pravda, 1958. It's from Archiv in Bremen in Germany. Let me try to translate it like a buzz of the reactionist propaganda around the, the literary weed, which means it meant the like undesirable elements. Uh, and um, let's, let, let's compare it to the uh, Belarusian articles. Do we need Alexievich's? You know this kind of. Soviet, like Soviet language, or a literary newspaper in, uh, uh, from Russia. It's the literary man of the proper caliber or something. And in all these um, mass media articles, we had these three elements. First of all, the West is an enemy. For instance, a quotation from the newspaper Kultura, uh, uh, the culture. The award was needed to organize an attack on Russia and Putin. It was a political operation. We have this element of critical stance of the author towards authorities. Uh, Literaturna Gazeta, the main idea of her creative work is anti-Sovietism. Also, uh, the head of the Francisco Corona Belarusian Language Society, Trusso, said, it's not Bunin, Pasternak, Naboko, it's publicism as usual, like journalism as usual. Here we have this poor quality of the literary work. But um, let's look at also authorities in, uh, in, uh, on uh, societies uh, in Belarus and Russia. I would explain the reactions in societies with the diffusion of norms and the adaptation of the national sentiments. Because we know that this, you know, this national sentiments in Russia after the Ukrainian crisis, uh, they were adapted also in Belarus and then just um, right, adapted to the national circumstances in Belarus. And we have this national sentiments <coughs> and uh, the acceptance of uh, autocratic power as long as there is no war, which uh, the, the mm -hmm. first um, uh, uh, presenter talked about. Um, right, Alexievich has, this, has three identities, the Belarusian, the Ukrainian, and the Russian one, and she's also very critical to the Soviet heritage. She said that the heaviest heritage of the socialism is a man, a traumatized man. So uh, this stance uh, couldn't make her uh, a unifying figure for Belarusian Russian society because it reflects that, like her identity reflects the crisis of identity in the post-Soviet space. And we also had these reactions in Belarus where we have the Facebook group Noble Together, people gathered in cafes. Like in, it was a rather marginally uh, thing. Uh, they, there was the support from the key opposition leaders like Nikolaev, Sannikov, uh, Zisir, uh, and also um, the uh, 57 of respondents. Uh, they, uh, support, they supported uh, Alexievich, but we also had those 43%. And uh, here, when, the, uh, when there were articles where people compared how many, how many times she used words Russia and Belarus, and that Belarusian writers write in Belarus and, and so on. Uh, reactions in Russia were the same. It's interesting to mention here how Alexievich was, uh, uh, was connected with two different Russian worlds. The first Russian world without Putin, like uh, Kashin or Gelman or Dmitry Bukov, they, they tried to connect Alexievich with the alternative Russian world. They said Alexievich embodies all features of the Russian world as it should have been without Putin. Another group of intellectuals, they like Prizahar Prilepin, they tried to connect Alexievich with Putin's Russian world. In fact, this is an award to Russia, to its independence, its influence, its place in the world. And that all, of course, there was a lot of critic, criticism. Unfortunately, it was the Nobel Prize for hating Russia. 
Um, at the end, I would like to um, to explain my um, like to, to to give an explanation. Uh, I assume that uh, this um, the level of authoritarian embeddedness can explain uh, the events around Alexievich's Nobel Prize. And uh, we have here this Soviet legacy, the Soviet space, and uh, we have post-Soviet space where different countries uh, and different neighbors influence each other. Uh, and uh, in this spatio-temporal system of coordinates, it's hard for Alexievich to become a unifying figure for the post-Soviet community, both for, both for authorities and for uh, our society. Thank you. Thank you very much.